gonna go over installing the TCS caster camber plates on your GE, GD, GK uh, fit. Uh, today we have a GE8 uh, that we're gonna just talk a, a little bit about the what and the why. Uh, we have another car that David's gonna be doing an install uh, throughout the course of this video just to explain the process uh, by which how to get these installed and why. We'll go ahead and just talk briefly about the reason for doing this mod, uh, why I originally came up with it, and why it's probably the best thing that you can do for a fit or a CRZ chassis. So these cars do not have a lot of caster factory. Uh, they have about three degrees or sub three degrees, and it makes the car feel very darty and makes the steering very quick. And that's a problem when you get on track because the car feels nervous. Also, it will lose camber dynamically as it turns because the car will blow through the camber faster than it creates it. So the reason why I put everything into one adjustment, even though I call them a caster camber plate, is we know what our goals are. We don't need to have independent adjustments to reach our goals. Basically, we're always going to be looking to max out the caster adjustment. So if we just take a look at how these plates are installed, this is our K-Swap Type R fit. We are roughly at a 45 degree angle relative to the center line of the car, okay? So we're targeting that the, the two imaginary lines coming out of the trajectory of this shock are meeting somewhere in the center of the dash. The reason being is these cars, when you use an offset camber bolt, you can only achieve about two and a half degrees negative camber, uh, which is not enough if you're using this car for a track day car or a competition vehicle. So we need the ability to gain about another degree of available camber. Doesn't mean that we'll run it that high. Negative 3.5 is, is too much, but we wanna be able to achieve negative 2.7 to negative 3.2, depending on our tire size, track surface, and how much power we have. So by installing them at an angle like this, you pick up a degree of native negative camber. So now using the eccentric crash bolts at the knuckle, we'll be able to achieve a target camber as high as negative 3.5. Again, we don't necessarily wanna be there, but we wanna have the ability to try it out but we are splitting our uh, adjustment range in a compound adjustment orientation by having them both in one sweep. The reason being too is it doesn't force us to have double stack height so that we have two independently adjustable plates that just reduces uh, shock shaft travel. So by doing it in one, you're able to get target caster, you're able to have the ability to hit your target, higher target cambers, and this is what we found works the best. So at this angle or near this angle, uh, this car is negative, or excuse me, positive 5.7 degrees caster, almost six degrees, around double the factory. Um, and it gives us the range to have one more degree negative. So we could run negative 3.5. This car runs uh, negative uh, 2.4 because it's also a street car. So you wanna think about how you're using the car. If it's primarily a street car and you do occasional track days, your target alignment specs are gonna be a lot different than if it's a dedicated car that goes to the track only. In this case, you know, we're relatively low in the camber game, but we're taking full advantage of the caster. And it doesn't matter how you use the car, if you intend to go anything over 80 miles per hour in these cars, they get extremely twitchy. So you wanna have that caster. So people have asked, you know, why do I, do I just install it like a normal camber plate? No, you know, we install them at this rotated angle so that we pick up both of those adjustments at once, okay? So that's just a brief understanding of uh, why they're installed this way. I'm gonna go ahead, we'll cut to Dave doing the install. I'll talk you guys through that verbally as he's doing it, and then we'll just do a follow-up on uh, alignment specs and stuff at the end. All right, guys, so first we're gonna get the cowl off here. On the GE chassis, everything is gonna be hidden underneath the cowl. GD, it is exposed. It's a good idea to get the GD cowl off as well. Go ahead and pull that out of there. 
So once you have access to the top hats, it's just gonna be basic uninstallation uh, as standard. I'm gonna go ahead and pull the coilovers off. This car specifically, we're gonna do our TCS uh, spec DS dampers as well. So we're gonna go ahead and get the brake line off. Get the hubs apart, get the knuckles apart. Get that factory strut out of there. Go ahead and get the axle nut off. Sometimes these things are tricky, so you got you can use the socket to get that axle moving. Depending on where you are in the country, you'll have more rust than other folks. So you can go ahead and get that socket on there and pound it out. Just a good idea so that the axle doesn't become separated. And then uh, what we like to do is hold the center shock shaft with an Allen key and then uh, get the top nut off. Uh, it's just an easier way to reach down in there. So what Dave's doing now is he's supporting the other unsprung weight so that it doesn't pull everything down uh, by getting that jack stand on there. It's just gonna be a little bit easier to manage without accidentally separating the axle. Go ahead and pull your lower brace off. Now usually what we do is we remove the sway bars from the front of these cars in general. Much more helpful if you have a K-swap car as well, just to have more room for the header. In this case, we're cutting the thing out because you can snake the sway bar out of there. If you cut it in half. Uh, the sway bar is junk. Don't run them. We just throw them in the trash. So you can go ahead and cut that in half and throw it away. If you want, you can drop the subframe and, and save the sway bar. It's really pointless, but it's up to you. So then we go ahead and we mark the underside of the strut tower here. You can see where there was a mark where the original uh, rubber top cap used to be. You can use that as like a cutting guide. You wanna cut just above that line. And Dave is using an air saw here. Uh, everybody is gonna be doing this a little bit differently depending on what sort of tools you have at your disposal. So Dave likes to use an air saw. A lot of times I'll use a cutoff wheel and go around the line from underneath. And we'll get close to the line. Uh, we won't cut directly on the line. Um, and then, you know, we'll take a grinder to it and get everything smoothed out and approach that line slowly. You know, you can always take material away, but you can't put it back conveniently. So just work up to that line slowly and uh, make a nice, clean, you know, clean cut. So you can see he's got a rough cut in here now. Um, he'll go back and clean it up with a die grinder. There we go. Just slowly getting that top cut smoothed out, and looking nice, looking uniform and even. And you'll see, so if you cut at that line or just slightly above that line that he made where the rubber uh, top hat used to touch the strut tower before, it leaves this nice little upward swept curve. Um, just adds a little bit more rigidity there. One of the main reasons why we like to do the full top plate um, as opposed to some of these uh, center located caster adjustment devices that are out there on the market is these strut towers actually do have a habit of breaking spot welds uh, when you start going up in spring rate. So by dispersing the load uh, farther out on the strut tower, you're actually reducing the likelihood that you're gonna break spot welds and crack these strut towers and stuff like that. So, um, you know, some people are afraid to make the cuts or, or don't wanna make the cuts. And, uh, you know, one of the large reasons why I originally made this design was we needed to spread that load out. You know, at, at a 10K spring in the front, I was popping spot low. Well, there I am. All right, so then what you can do right now, he's using one of the old plates, our old design plates to mark uh, the positions. He put some grease on the bolt heads and he's marking those positions. Now he's uh, putting a center punch there to start his drill. 
he'll go in with a small drill bit and then he'll step up larger sizes uh, to get to the final size. So you'll see underneath, when you look at uh, specifically the bottom of a GE chassis, the second gen, you'll see there are some indentations that look like they match the uh, three bolt pattern that we designed there. That's actually totally by coincidence. That's not um, necessarily where you're gonna put the holes, but you will see those three marks, those indentations in the strut tower pressing when they manufactured it. So depending on what you need out of the application as far as targeting caster uh, versus camber, you're gonna be able to change that at the time of install. So just think about what you want, how you intend to use the car. So right now he's making a recess cut in a small bracket that holds the hood hinge above the strut tower. This is just to have access to tighten the back corner bolt. So again, he just makes a mark and approaches the line slowly in order to only remove the material that's required to conveniently work on the car and tighten those bolts. So it's again, just test fitting. There we go. There it is. The hole's finally drilled. So in this position, this car is uh, a street car and a track car. The target was, you know, always as much caster as possible, but we don't really see the need to go above 3.2 degrees negative camber. Um, so we're always making sure that we're targeting more of a caster modification than camber, because that's where your benefits are going to be. Uh, anywhere above five and a half degrees positive caster is going to have a humongous benefit over stock. Um, in this case, the position that we installed, the top hats gave us 5.6 degrees positive caster. So then you'll see here too, he's uh, just moving these bolts one position so that you can actually achieve the maximum amount of adjustment. Typically, we just max these out. Um, depending on how you install it, uh, you know, you'll pick up about a degree of camber capability over stock. And by st over stock, I mean, if you're using crash bolts or camber adjustment bolts at the knuckle, these cars in factory form can only get negative 2.5 degrees of camber. So this gives us the ability to achieve potentially negative 3.5. I do not recommend anybody run it there but we max it out for maximum caster. We gain about a degree of camber there. And then we'll use the uh, camber bolts at the knuckle to actually reduce our camber. Uh, that also subsequently reduces kingpin inclination as well. So uh, that's how we prefer to do them. It also helps us get to a better or closer to a zero bump steer geometry as well. Now that's gonna depend heavily on ride height, um, but the goal is to produce as little bump steer as possible, uh, as much caster as possible, and targeting somewhere in the two and a half to 3.2 degrees negative camber, depending on how you're using the car. In this case, uh, we were targeting 1.8 in the front because it's primarily a street car. Um, once you start doing track days and racing and things like that, you're going to find that 2.7, 2.8 is really the, the sweet spot target. So now what he's done is he's removed the preload on the spring completely. Now, do not follow the directions on BC's out-of-the-box directions. We do not run preload on these springs. We just do enough to take up the slack on the spring. So as the shock reaches full extension, it's not doing so under pressure. Uh, so that's your final assembly there. That's with the modified uh, top plate on the standard BC coilover setup. So we're gonna go ahead and access the rear. That's the uh, location of the rear shock there shaft. Same situation, hold the shock shaft with an Allen wrench and we're gonna use a 14 millimeter to get that top nut loose. 
Now, if you're throwing your shocks away, you can just use an impact gun if you have it. Dave wanted to do it with uh, the tools that any average person might have at their house. There he goes, using an impact anyway. But uh, he just wanted to mimic, okay, look, you know, if these are the tools that you have at your disposal, it's quite possible to do it like this at home. Remove the lower shock bolt. That's a 14 millimeter as well. Now he's got the factory springs out. Now we install these opposite of how BC recommends. We put the adjuster at the bottom. The reason being is it's much easier to access to make ride height adjustments uh, when it's at the bottom. Ultimately, the stack height of the assembly is the same. Uh, we just prefer them on the bottom as far as making our adjustments to ride height. Uh, we've never ever seen an adverse effect from doing it this way. So this is the BC shock. We're gonna go ahead and loosen up that bottom uh, jam nut uh, that jams the uh, shock body to the lower cup. Then we're gonna transfer the original bushing from the original rear shock. That assembly goes back in and basically where it rests, you're gonna use a jack or something to pick up the rear beam. You're gonna pull the slack out of the rear springs um, just to the point where they're captured and cannot fall out. And then we're gonna run our lower perch cup up to uh, the minimum height. This is gonna basically mimic at full extension on these uh, shock bodies. Uh, this is where the position will be. So your spring, no matter what, can never fall out. Now we've changed the uh, shock body dimension so that you're still getting good travel, but you're also use, potentially using the bump stop if you need it, as well as having enough body clearance uh, from the shock body to the body so that you're using as much travel as you possibly can. So this is how we prefer to set them up. Okay, so then he's going ahead and tightening the top, sh top shock nut. Again, holding the uh, shock shaft with an Allen key because you do not want to just zip these on with an impact gun, okay? There have been occasions where you have potential to loosen up the valve body nut on the inside of the shock, and that causes a whole bunch of problems. So just use an Allen key, hold the shock shaft in one position, and tighten the top nut. Hit him with the torque wrench. Now he's touching up the cuts that he made with some OEM Honda touch-up paint. This is just obviously to fight off corrosion. There we are. So you'll see the top hat is at like a 45 degree angle roughly, um, but we're targeting more, cast, more caster than we are camber. You know, the, the goal here is to have more caster, more caster, more caster. You know, you don't need much more negative camber in these things to make them uh, super viable. You really need more caster, and we're gonna be able to use that caster to increase our dynamic camber as we turn. So the outside wheel will actually increase its camber as it turns. So don't worry about that static negative camber setting being crazy, you don't need it. You don't need it. I've raced these cars for years and years and years. You do not need it. Go ahead and tighten those uh, lower shock bolts. So during the alignment process, um, one of those bolts is gonna have an offset in it, and he's gonna use that to dial in our target camber um, at time of alignment. But uh, just for demonstration's sake, he just went ahead and put those bolts back in. Okay, so that's the install portion of the video. At this point, you would be putting your car back together and going for an alignment or aligning the car yourself, depending on what your skill level is. For the blue car, we targeted negative 1.8. It is primarily a street car. The car ended up with 5.5 degrees positive caster and uh, negative 1.8 uh, degrees camber in the front. The rears are non-adjustable, doesn't really matter, they're along for the ride. Depending on what you're using the car for, what I've found works really, really well for me is focusing heavily on trying to remove the bump steer, looking at the sweep through the wheels travel and trying to reduce the bump steer as much as possible. From that 
goal of zero bump steer derives the uh, negative camber setting to a certain degree. You can sort of play with ride height in order to achieve that by the natural resting position of the steering arm and the knuckle relative to ride height. You can also do that by cambering the lower which will actually move the natural resting position of the steering arm as you reduce it. So what I've found works really well for me, negative 2.7 to negative 2.8 degrees camber. Positive caster, I've been as high as positive six. So think about that when it comes time to doing the install on the plates and where they're placed. Okay, you wanna to try to get them as far back as possible. There is a limited amount of real estate in this area to get these bolt holes through. You wanna do it in a place there where it's going to conveniently land the nut and you'll be able to tighten everything down. Don't worry so much about, is the thing absolutely as tight as it can be? The entire weight of the vehicle is on top of that plate. It's not going anywhere. As long as there's not a ton of slop in those holes, it's gonna stay where you put it. So focus more on getting the plate put where you need it, depending on your use case for the car. But I found a very good baseline setup is negative 2.7 to negative 2.8 uh, camber, and positive 5.6 to positive six degrees caster, and you run a relatively moderate ride height. I usually run a staggered wheel and tire setup. What I found works best for me is a 225, 205 stagger if you're on a stock motor. That would be like a 15 inch wheel. If you have a K-series engine or, or more power, you can run as big as a 17. Uh, I've run 255 in the front with 225 in the rear. You can also do a 245, 225 or 245, 215. You don't necessarily have to worry about stagger. I would assume if you're buying our coil over set up at the same time that you bought the top hats, we would have already gone through, talked about use case of the car, and I would have set you up with spring rates that work for your wheel and tire package. So definitely refer to us on how you intend to use the car, and I can give you alignment specs based on what you're trying to accomplish. So, but a good baseline setup is negative 2.7, negative 2.8, and positive 5.6 to positive 6, uh, focusing heavily on minimizing bump steer. That's it. You know, hope this was helpful. I've been delayed for some time trying to get a video out uh, explaining the what and the why. Um, I can dive much deeper into you know what I found over the years of developing this, but honestly, what I wanted to make was something that was relatively simple, you know, for the average guy to be able to put in in his house, you know, over the course of a weekend, maybe with a buddy. It's it doesn't need to be as complicated as some people make it. Uh, it can be as complicated as you want it to be. So just trying to reduce the bump steer and maximizing your caster as much as possible, and you're really going to enjoy these chassis on track. Thanks. <laughs>